Hello and welcome. My name is Jeff Kite and I uh, work for Hewlett Packard Enterprise in our um, professional services organization that focuses on uh, cloud types of solutions and paths. And uh, wanted to share with you an interesting case study that I recently have been working on where we were basically asked if we could take something complex like installing OpenStack and we could fully automate it so it could be installed in the factory. And as part of that, there were certain constraints we had um, to be able to do to, uh, with certain sets of tools that we would have available to us. And uh, so um, this basically focuses on kind of that journey and uh, some of the things that we did. So if, if, if you step, step back and look at what it takes, if you have um, disparate pieces of hardware and you have all that physical rack and stack um, you have all the connecting of it together, and then you have to make sure that that infrastructure is um, at the correct levels for firmware and other things like that. So the, wanted to make sure that we could take that section of the, the physical provisioning as well as um, configuring it to get ready for OpenStack and then um, put it in a automated configuration so we didn't have to have an expensive person sitting there all the time babysitting this, this type of installation. So that's kind of the background. All right, so this slide just talks about some of those, those deployment challenges I mentioned. Um, we wanted to be able to um, take the hardware that was physically connected together um, without any other configuration that had been done and then actually uh, use automation to deploy um, all of the infrastructure configurations as well as then OpenStack. So the different phases I divided this up into, of course, we had the physical integration that was done by another part of the factory. And then in the infrastructure configuration, we wanted to configure uh, the top of rack switches, um, both the data switches and the management switches, as well as the uh, what we call server integrated lights out or your management processor. So uh, anything that's IPMI, like. We wanted to be able to be consistent with the server BIOS and also um, do all the configuration of the, the storage arrays that sit in the servers themselves. Afterwards, we wanted to be able to make sure that we could have a certain level of testing to make sure the network was correct, that everything was consistent between all the different nodes. And so we do that infrastructure testing and validation and then wanted to go ahead and deploy uh, OpenStack itself. In this case, we we're using Helium OpenStack that was already um, Ansible based in its uh, installation. After that, we wanted to be able to take the, uh, the installation and do certain sets of testing and validation to make sure that OpenStack was functioning. So we looked at some of the existing tools that the factory had access to, and these are, of course, the same ones that customers in our field do as well, and realized that I didn't want to go too far outside of their, their realm of experience in case they had to uh, do any troubleshooting. So what I wound up selecting was certain tools that pre-existed that um, could be used to take XML types of configuration files and then you know, load them onto the servers before other types of interfaces were, were configured. For. And so, um, I included the, these tools for completeness. Um, one of the notable things I found out whenever um, our high performance compute teams put together very large clusters, they actually had a, a test and validation suite that the factory was very familiar with. So I wound up using that um, as a, uh, the test and validation. All the other pieces primarily were open source types of things using Cobbler instead of something like one view using Vagrant um, to spin up some of the, uh, the management VMs that would actually do the work so we could get some scale out of this as well. And then took advantage of things that were built into Ansible like Jinja 2 templating. So the platform wound up being, because I wanted to be able to scale this, what I, I instantiated on a VM host and then connected that to the top of rack switches. Um, so uh, the kind of the high level is that I knew that I wanted to be able to easily take customer input in 
And I wanted to get that into Ansible configuration files. So we already were using Excel spreadsheets for certain part of the customer integration experience. So I just basically came up with a spreadsheet where I could dump those values out uh, and then put it into the, to the same uh, basic configuration that Ansible required for its host file. And that's, this is an example of that. So um, as part of our customer intent documentation, um, I may wanted to make this totally configurable um, from a, and, and variable in terms of things of which networks I'm gonna be implementing. Um, and the number of servers, number of disks, data desks per servers. This, was, this particular one was gonna be focusing on um, what we call Swift um, object store. And so wanted to be able to also use advanced configurations for that. So once again, the Excel spreadsheet generates the Ansible configuration file. Then I realized that originally I was just using bare metal servers. And because of needing to be able to scale, I decided to build um, images for Vagrant to be able to, to spin up as I needed each set of uh, infrastructure deploy so I could have multiple of these going simultaneously. So I took the cluster test environment, which is basically a Red Hat based um, environment with the, with the test and validation suite on top of it. And then the Cobbler was um, already being used in Helium OpenStack. So I basically took that and made a Packer image of that as well so we could, we could uh, use that with Vagrant. And then I customized the Vagrant um, files with Jinja 2 so that I could have custom networking schemes or if we had variations in sites where we were having this uh, running then we could be able to do stuff like that. So we uh, basically vagrant up the, the cluster test VM. We do some additional network configurations and then we, uh, we bring up the, the cobbler as well. And so this is just an example some of the, uh, the Jinja 2 type of logic you can put into um, any files that you're templating. So if, if, if you have a whole lot of hardware um, not, and nothing's configured yet, uh, the first thing I had to do was configure my top rack switches. So I knew that I wanted to be able to take a pair of 10 gig switches, for example, and um, and make, be consistent with how I connected the servers into them so I could be able to use templating for, for these files. So if you look down at the, the bottom left hand side, I, I made as a requirement that we were going to wire these the same way every single time we, we, we pushed them through the factory and we could have a variable number of um, objects, servers, as well as um, PAC or the, uh, the Swift proxy account container servers. And then what I did was I generate a, I have the possibility of generating a, um, if you take the two switches and link them together in high availability mode, we call that IRF. And so I have a version for that as well as if we, if we kept them distinct. Um, but primarily we're using these in IRF mode. So we um, push that out. Now, I could have automated actually loading this configuration up into the switches, but the people that were going to be running, the, it makes them really nervous. So they wanted to be able to manually um, copy this up to the switch and leave it as a file, then copy it to the startup, startup switch configuration file, which makes sense. Um, so this was a semi-automatic step, so to speak. But once again, um, dumped out the, the configuration. And then I used the, the Jinja 2 to customize it for things like IRF, which is on the top here that you can see as well as the definitions of the VLANs. And also put some logic in there as well. If, for example, if your, if your management processor network was the same as your, um, your OpenStack management network, you could basically have some flexibility in making sure that, that the uh, network switch configurations um, would come up correctly. So with this step, we, we move the file up, we reboot the switches, and now they're, they're configured as expected. That now allows me to do some um, discovery because right now nothing else understands what their IP addresses are. Um, and I, what I really want to do next is to boot into the cluster test environment. 
so that I can um, use some of the tools that have commands that will change the management processors on each of the individual switches or pl apply bi BIOS or configure the storage arrays. So this is an example of once I boot into the cluster test environment, I then use Ansible to, um, with that same exact host file, to go out to each node in the cluster and then take you know, different XMLs that I created to do things like change the network settings, uh, the host name, add an administration user and password, or if it already exists, to change um, that administration password. But basically came up with some playbooks and logic that would do each of these steps moving forward. So now once ILO is configured, um, I'm able to basically, so, okay, so there's, if you think about this, there's, there's two sets of IP address schemes that will, be, will happen in, over the course of this automation. One is in the cluster test environment, which is consistent every single time, and that's why I can actually uh, do the configurations um, consistently at this, at this stage in, in the game. And then there will also be one when we're actually installing OpenStack itself. Um, in a similar way, after I install ILO, I can go and basically take a BIOS captured XML file and say I want to be consistent based on the model of machine it is. So I know which model each of the servers are and which roles they play um, because I guess one, one thing I forgot to mention is that um, when I first turn the servers on before I configure the ILO in the last step, I have a, a script that runs against the network switches that looks at all the ports to see which MAC addresses are coming up on them. And so I'm only looking at port one network switch and how they're attached. So I grab those MAC addresses so I can boot into the cluster test environment. Um, and later on, I'm going to be able to just discover these things through the RESTful API now that the management processor has an IP address. But with these particular ones, we decided that we're still going to use the CONREP tool that HP had that takes and basically you can, you can configure a certain server exactly the way you want it and use CONREP to dump the XML out. And then I basically upload that file, that XML file, based on the server type and the role. And so this is just an example of that. This, uh, the, the, the server storage array controllers were a little more interesting because I really wanted this to, to be variable. So instead of, and I knew that this would change from even more so from, from customer to customer. So one thing I did was I go out and recursively discover through the RESTful API that Hewlett Packard has on the, uh, on the management processor. And I go and I to the, basically get the uh, array controller information. And that has some, some other um, URLs, if you will, that point to other parts of the, uh, the configuration itself. So if you go, you start at the top, you, you find out how many controllers does it have in it. And then you have a link to each of those controllers to get more information. Then you go down and grab the JSON from those controllers to find out um, which disks they have underneath them. And so basically, once again, we're doing, so we're doing a little bit more logic here. Um, we, we get the information in the inventory from the, uh, from the management processor itself. And I wind, wind up building two types of lists. I want to be able to configure boot disks, and I want to be able to configure the data disks for the object store. So um, I also have, later on, I realized that I wanted to be able to do some documentation, some as-built types of documentation. And so what I wind up doing is build a new matrix of information, or array of information, really, where I have certain elements that I need um, and I want to discover, and I want to pull out and put in the as-built document. So we map each of the disks in this particular um, implementation based on the model type of the disk. Um, another option was to do it based on the location in the server or um, size of disks. We had, we had some different, we played around with some different uh, variations. But that's how we separate them out into boot, 
and uh, data disks. We then take the, 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 the um, smart array storage array controllers and we clear out the configuration and then we know which, which are the, the boot disks. So then we take and build a RAID 1 set for that. And you know, so some of the servers that I'm using may have up to three um, storage array controllers in it, but we already captured that when we, we got the information from the RESTful API a little bit earlier in the, uh, in the process. So we, we then create RAID 0 volumes for each of the other data disks because Swift is going to be able to manage that. And we still want to use the, the, the array controllers because if you want to use full disk encryption or other things like that, then you can, you can activate that um, since Swift, uh, I guess, object encryption is, is, is uh, just uh, appearing now. So we recursively go through the, the data disk set and uh, we, we build all of those disks. So once this is, is done, now all the hardware is, is at kind of that state I want to have before I install OpenStack. And so we move into kind of a, the next phase. So I want to test this to make sure it's good. Um, the, uh, the cluster test I got from our high performance compute folks um, has this neat thing called cluster consistency in it. And th so this is before it was consistent. I wanted you to see how there were some red things on the list but you basically refresh it and it'll check the BIOS, it'll check the storage, it'll check the memory, it'll check all these different elements to make sure that the, cl the cluster is consistent and equivalent across the different types of nodes in the environment. Um, another element I can do in here as well as run network tests, performance tests, or even just to double check that the VLANs are set up right on the top of rack switches and consistent among all the, uh, the nodes in the cloud. So the next thing we do, so we've been using, we've been running all these commands from the cluster test VM um, with, and so these are all Ansible playbooks. And so I'm kind of moving to a new phase where I want to image the deployer node for OpenStack. So I have to shut down, you know, the DHCP server that's already been running in cluster test. And then I use the cobbler that was built in to Helium OpenStack to um, basically create that very first node. So there's, so there's a cobbler that sits outside of the environment, which is just another VM. And I use that to image the first node in the cluster. Uh, I grab the rest, use the RESTful API to grab things like the MAC addresses so I can build the configuration files for cobbler. And then I basically install that first node, that deployer node, um, via Ansible. So I, I run a script that says, image the HLM node. So when th once that is done, I need to go in and configure it and set it up so that that node can actually uh, image everything else in the environment. So there's, there's you know, little, I guess, housekeeping things we need to do, like we need to uh, make sure that we, we run an SSH key scan so that we aren't prompted for certain passwords. We redirect instead of using the cluster test IP addresses, now we want to use the, um, what the OpenStack deployment is going to use. So that's still, once again, that same exact host configuration file. Um, I want to update the SSH keys. Um, I have certain scripts in the environment that allow me to have some added levels of security. Um, and then I also have some scripts that I might want to run later to do things like um, test the performance of the environment, things that are included in, in basic OpenStack. So I, I set all those things up. I run through the initialization process for the lifecycle manager. And then next, I want to, um, to alter the model of, uh, of the, the Swift object store. So this is just basically like updating configuration files. But it's a little bit different on the, uh, the Helium OpenStack in that it's it's a model where you, you basically compile it, and then you, uh, you're using version um, revision checking with, uh, with Git, so you can have a revision control system. So we go, we go through that process, install the model, gets the MAC addresses from the remaining nodes, and then, we, um, and then we basically go out and we install. Oh, I also generate customized security certificates as well 
but then go in and install using the Jinja 2 templates to go in and then commit the model. Um, at that point, we're ready to deploy OpenStack. And so run another playbook still on the, the cluster test node, which go goes out and runs the playbook on the lifecycle manager. Make sure we uh, wipe the disks before we do the installation. We deploy the cloud. And then we patch it if, if needed, if any uh, patches have come out since then. And we configure the CPUs and basically and, and any customizations that we need to do for performance. After this, we go in and I run the OpenStack Tempest tests that are targeted for the type of solution that's there. Um, there are some additional functional tests for certain services, like I think um, the, the, the Swift developers like to use another set of functional tests instead of the Tempest ones. Um, There's some performance tests that I run to make sure that um, it's operating in, in kind of in, in, in a range of expected behavior. And then I want to take those test reports every single time I run them and keep a history of them and then generate a, a, an as-built type of document. I wind up using um, a combination, once again, of Jinja 2 with Markdown um, templates. And then I take those Markdown templates and turn them into HTML so that you can either display them um, in the installation environment um, in the, or convert them over to PDF. Uh, to be delivered or printed out, delivered, whatever it needs to be done. So, well, there was a lot. Um, that's kind of the, uh, and so I, with this particular um, automation, I literally can go from the, the point where the, the network is, network switches are configured and rebooted, and then it can be one button from that point on. Or, um, I can split it up into different phases. So right now I have it in different phases because we have, uh, I guess, the, ex the experience level of the people that are going to be running this day to day are um, more entry level and not un understanding OpenStack and what allow allows them to be able to have some confidence. And but uh, with with the Ansible playbooks being idempotent, anyway, um, they're for you know. For example, we just have them, if something failed, they, we have them run that command again, and it usually, uh, so we go through the troubleshooting process. Built into the scripts, we wound up doing some, a little bit more checking, I think, than I normally would do to make sure that people weren't being stupid in like, you know, the, the, the input file or, or stuff like that. But uh, that's basically kind of our journey. Are there any questions? I assume we're supposed to use this. Yeah. Uh, so we, we do a very similar thing. Uh, we made a lot of similar choices as you did uh, for deploying for in our factories and also for our customers. Uh, one thing we had to do, which I'm curious if you had to do, was build a fairly uh, large array of like mirrors and stuff because often we found where we were doing the installs in the factory and whatnot had limited to no internet access. Did you have issues with that, or was that help dealt with at like the Helion install stack uh, level of it? I basically um, made it well. So we have we have four integration centers around the world where we have different levels of connectivity, but all of those are fairly consistent. I also wanted to have a version of this where a consultant could just take their laptop and spin up the cluster test VMs and the um, and the uh, the cobbler VM and be able to if they had to really reinstall it in the field quickly, uh, and be able to take the same input file. Um, that hasn't been done yet, so we might be hitting some of those things as well. But uh, as far as like, especially like organizational memory, being able to you know keep a record of, of what was done. Well, I guess uh, in the factory, all, something that will always happen is we'll keep a record of the as-built document that has all the serial numbers, and how the configuration, and all the disks, and all, all the individual pieces as well. But yeah. Uh, and then when you were Pixie booting, were you installing from an image itself or were you doing like the um, install from answers, answers file kind of install? Okay, there's the two, school? there were two levels of Pixie booting. The first one was Pixie booting into the cluster test environment, which is a diskless environment that has a shadow root across all the different nodes. That one's used a lot in the factory because they don't want to put anything on the disks unless they actually have to. 
So um, that environment was discovered through the network switches, but they would have to be Pixie booting for me to be able to discover them, right? So, um, so we did find out, like, I guess one time the factory reversed the cables on all the servers, and we had nothing, right? But uh, so uh, we had to do a little bit more documentation for them on that. Uh, the second time around, I'm actually used, because now I have access to the management processors, I'm actually going and grabbing, um, I'm having Ansible discover those as part of the, uh, the playbook, the task. And so then I grab that from a Pixie boot and then put that in the equivalent of our server's YAML file so that when we do the uh, you know, cobbler deploy, it, it pulls all that information in and then when we do the bare metal re-image, it does that as well. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, yes, I have one. Um, for, um, I guess this is more for like uh, um, switching out servers and, and whatnot for the hardware side. Is there ability to validate firmware levels and adjust that as needed so it's consistent and across your network? Right, so in the, in the factory there is, because when I boot in that cluster test environment, firmware revs are one of the, one of the things that, um, that it goes and it discovers. So, right there. So I, I find, so if this, is, if this winds up being all green, I know I'm good. Um, it, firmware is one of those, and, but it even looks at the firmware, the disks themselves, and all the different components. And so it knows, you know, it, it just highlights anything that is different. And then so we would address that then. Now, um, in the field, what I probably would do is I could discover all of that. There's a firmware um, part of the RESTful API, which I could also use to go and query to make sure that everything was consistent. Um, that's, that's probably a, a really good idea now that I'm thinking about it because we have to allow for what's going on in the factory and then also what's, what's going on in the field as well. And so as you mentioned, if you take a, a server or have to replace a server, then many of the components will be different. Have any issues with V6, IPv6, or is this something that y'all delved into yet? Um, I believe the revision of OpenStack that I was using here was all IPv4. I think there are certain networks that were IPv6 capable, but I haven't had to deal with that. Um, although I do have a customer asking for that right now. All right, and, and that view that you have there is that is that that's not HP one view, is it? No, no, no. This is a, um, is it's, 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 I, I'm not even sure if it's a formal product. I'd have to check on that, but it's um, out of our high performance compute um, team. It's just, it's a package they call cluster test that I was using because the factory uses it. However, I have used OneView to do these types of things as well. It's just that the factory didn't want to import all of these servers into a OneView instance and do all that type of update, so to speak. So that's why I had to use a different set of tools to do that. But this cluster test environment, because it's booting up diskless, um, and it has all of the um, configuration tools built into it, enabled me to be able to do, do a lot of those types of things. Now, my next revision, as we're looking to the next generation, I probably would do a lot more with, with, with um, configurations and the RESTful API. So you can post as well as, as get information. And so I might, uh, I might uh, evolve it to that as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Well, I hope this was useful to you guys. Thanks for coming.